and uh, you'll be with us uh, tonight. Next week, next Sunday night, I'll begin a series of messages called Mirrors and Windows on the Parables of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we'll begin that next week, but be with us if you would tonight. And then also Wednesday night, it will be in the book of Joel, right here at 7 o'clock. Of course, 6.30 is Awana, Faith Works for the Teens. And uh, so be with us on Wednesday night. A few other things that are coming up we want to remind you of. Uh, this coming Saturday is our community outreach from 10 a.m. till noon. And so you meet us out there in the lobby, and we'll have a great time with that this coming Saturday. Also, uh, let me just say that um, we are just, I guess, a week and a half or so away from our golf tournament. And so if you don't have the information for that yet, you can go by the Welcome Center and get that. And I hope you'll sign up for that and help and come part of it. That's a fundraiser we do for our school Wednesday, October 9th at 8 a.m. And all the information is in there, or you can contact uh, the church for it. Let me also say that we are just two weeks away. It looks like everything goes swell from being back in the chapel. The carpet starts going down tomorrow, and the pews go in the next week. And so our plan right now is to be back in there for October 13th for the evening service. And uh, it's going to be a great time. I, I want you to come that night as we have our first service back in there. You, just a big change in there. It looks so great, so wonderful. And uh, you can come in, try the new seating out. See, that's critical for people. They don't care about paint. No, they do care about all that. But isn't it nice to have a nice seat? And uh, so anyways, uh, we're going to do that two weeks from today. It should go well. And so I hope that you'll be a part of it. And let me say also, if you haven't yet been part of the giving to it, you can find that the next step that is out there. And uh, I hope all of our church family will give something toward that. And, uh, and this project has been going so well, and we want to get it done. And uh, just a reminder, if you do um, $1,200 toward that project, whether it's over a series of months or whether one-time gift, uh, you can do a pew in honor or memory of somebody. And that's what we're doing. And so I hope that if you want to be part of that, you'll get this information. And uh, thank you for doing that already, many of you that have. All right. Men, if you'll come, let's receive the offering now. One thing I'll say to some of you as far as our giving, you also can frequently give online. We have a lot of our folks that give online now. I know a lot of, uh, a lot of the younger generation, they like doing that. And so uh, sometimes you see the, the offering come by, but you can also give all that online and I encourage you to do that and always be faithful in our tithes and offerings. And God has so provided for our church and I'm thankful that he has, all right? Mr. Whitehead, why don't you come, uh, principal of our school. And by the way, didn't we have a time Friday night? Man, we just had a time Friday night. Boy, that was great. Good crowd. And let's just be honest, those fireworks were something. I mean, I tell you what, yeah, that was good. I, I, um, I don't know how many people told me, Pastor, I've never been that close to fireworks before. And uh, I mean, they were right over our heads. We were, we were getting texts from people in the area saying, what's going on in Arlington? And uh, emails, texts, what is going on? Well, we just had a great time of celebration, 50 years in our school. And so I'm glad none of you were here with us on uh, Friday evening. Just had a great time with that. And thank you for that. All right. Mr. White, had you come pray for us? Let us pray. Great and mighty God, we do thank you, Lord. It is such a blessing to be able to gather in your house today and to thank you, Lord, for all that you have blessed upon us here at Arlington Baptist Church as well as Arlington Baptist School. We do thank you, Lord, for your continuous love toward us, O oh God, that you would give your only begotten Son that we might be set free from the bondage of sin. Lord, we love you today. We thank you for this time of taking up this offering. We pray that you will use it for the furtherance of your kingdom. For it is in Jesus' name that we do pray and ask these things. Amen and amen.
Amen. Thank you, Joy, for that. I want uh, Danny and Maureen, if you would come and bring, uh, bring your daughter with you. And we're going to do a baby dedication at this time, and it's always exciting. And uh, so I'm glad that uh, today we can do that. And I want, uh, matter of fact, some of the family here, why don't you, some of the family that are with you, why don't they come up too, all right? Come down here at least to the front, all the family that are with them, and you all come right now. We'll get that all taken care of. And uh, this is a very exciting time that we could do this. The Bible says that children are an heritage of the Lord, and I believe that sincerely. I know all three of our children, when they were born, we dedicated them to the Lord, and so we want to do this also, and so you all come down here, we'll do that. Come on up here. And if I could have all the rest of the family, if you all stand right down here, that would be great. Danny, how are you doing today? Doing Haven't we done this before? I thought so. They're on the group plan, you know. You love that, you know. Same time next year? Well, we'll leave that alone, all right? <laughs> but anyways, it's exciting to see what God is doing. And Danny and Marina have been blessed with uh, Sarah. And Sarah was born January 11th, 2019. Hello, Sarah. Yeah, she's looking at me like I have never seen anyone that good looking. That's what she's thinking right now. I don't think that's it. But uh, I am very thankful for this young couple and uh, that God has blessed them in a very special way. Now, I want you to understand when you dedicate a child to the Lord, we can't bestow salvation upon Sarah. I wish we could, but we can't. That's not biblical. They make their own decision for that. But what we want to do today is we want God to bless this family. We mean by that we want God to protect this family. We want God to give them wisdom as parents, as husband and wife, and that God would draw them very close together so in the decisions they make will show the Lord Jesus Christ and that, that Sarah will come to trust Christ at a young age and then to spend the rest of her life serving the Lord. And that's really the responsibility of all the family that's here too. They're here too also because they're going to try to support them and encourage them and love them because I'm going to tell you what, it takes a lot of work in the day and age we live to raise children for the, in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Don't you agree? Man, the world has got all kinds of things going against us, but I'm going to tell you what, it can be done. You can raise children that love the Lord and serve the Lord even in the day and age we live in. But it takes a lot of prayer. My wife always says raising kids is spending all your time on your knees. That's prayer, and it, it's true. And so we want to ask the Lord to bless this family and dedicate this precious little one that they have. And let's see, your son now is how old? Three years old, and the house is active. All right. And uh, so with the son they have and now the daughter that God has given to him. So I hope you will pray for Danny and Maureen and for little Sarah and pray that the Lord will just bless them in a marvelous way. So let's take them before the Lord as well as the family that's here with us today and ask God to bless in a marvelous way. Father, we come before you. I am thankful for your kindness and your goodness. I am thankful for this young couple and what you're doing in their lives. You've already given them a son. And now this precious little daughter, Sarah, I do ask, Father, that you would just bless them. I ask that you will meet all their needs. I ask that you would provide for them. I ask that you would grant them wisdom. Draw Danny and Maureen very close to one another. And that the devil would never get a foothold in their home. But rather that Christ would be honored and glorified and magnified above everything else. We ask that you will grant them wisdom on daily decisions they will make. I ask that Sarah would come to know Christ at a young age and that she would spend all of her days then following you. And I ask that you would just bless this home. May it be a fortress. May it be a stronghold. May it be a place where you are always honored. I ask that you would bless the family that's here today, some of their family that has come to support them, to encourage them, to lift them up in prayer also, just like we're doing as a church body right now, we are asking you to bless this entire family. So as even their extended family works with them and encourages them and does all they can for Sarah, that you would draw each one of them very close to you. We are thankful you're a God that hears our prayers. We're thankful you're a God that knows our hearts. We're thankful you're a God that knows every detail of our lives. So bless this home. May Christ be honored. We love you. We're thankful that you love us. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. Amen. Let me give you a little something here. Whoever wants to carry that little gift for you there. Just make sure we take them before the Lord and keep them. Get them in your prayer book. Pray for them. And we're here to help you any way we can, all right? Let's congratulate them today, all right? God bless you, Danny. Wonderful. Sarah, God bless you so much. I'll let you all be seated. Thank you all so much. We'll let you be seated. Make sure you say a word to the family right afterward. There is strength within the sorrow. There is beauty in our tears. And you meet us in our mourning with a love that casts out fear. You are working in our waiting, sanctifying us. When beyond our understanding, you're teaching us to trust. Your plans are still to prosper. You have not forgotten us. You're with us in the fire and the flood. You're faithful forever, perfect in love. You are sovereign You are wisdom unimagined. Who could understand your ways? Reigning high above the heavens, reaching down in endless grace. You're the lifter of the lowly, compassionate and kind. You surround and you uphold me, and your promises are my delight. Oh, your plans are still to prosper. You have not forgotten us. You're with us in the fire and the flood. You're faithful forever, perfect in love. You are sovereign over us. Even what the enemy means for evil, you turn it for our good. You turn it for our good and for your glory. Even in the valley, you are faithful. You're working for our good. You're working for our good and for your glory. Your plans are still to prosper. You have not forgotten us. You're with us in the fire and the flood. You're faithful forever, perfect in love. You are sovereign over us. You're faithful forever, perfect in love. You are sovereign.
Amen. Thank you, Faith, for that song. And open your Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 21. I move very quickly this morning. We have a number of folks joining the church here in just a few moments also. So it's been a great day, Baptize, baptism, people joining the church, baby dedication. I'm so tired I might not preach. No, that's not true. All right, 2 Samuel chapter number 21. Look at verse number 1 as we continue on this series of messages, A Heart for God. Seeing how we can have a heart for God, a heart like David had. This is going to be an interesting account. I need you to stay with me and listen to what God has for us. Verse 1. Then there was a famine in the days of David, three years, year after year. David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord answered, It is for Saul, for his bloody house, because he slew the Gibeonites. And the king, that's David, called the Gibeonites and said unto them, Now the Gibeonites were not of the children of Israel, but of the remnant of the Amorites. And the children of Israel had sworn unto them. And Saul sought to slay them in his zeal to the children of Israel and Judah. This is what David asked them there. Look at verse 3. Wherefore David said to the Gibeonites, What shall I do for you? And wherewith shall I make the atonement? Mark that word. That ye may bless the inheritance of the Lord. And the Gibeonites said unto him, We will have no silver nor gold of Saul, nor of his house. Neither for us shalt thou kill any man in Israel. And he said, What ye shall say, that will I do for you. Verse 5. And they answered the king, this is the Gibeonites, The man that consumed us and that devised against us that we should be destroyed from remaining in any of the coast of Israel, let seven of his sons be delivered unto us, and we will hang them up unto the Lord and Gibeah of Saul, whom the Lord did choose. And the king said, I will give them. But the king spared Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, because of the Lord's oath that was between them, between David and Jonathan, the son of Saul. Let me stop right there just for time's sake. I'll read more in a moment. This is a difficult account. It's a, it's a difficult story. I, I know this story for many years, but it was actually just a few years ago when April and I were talking. And by the way, I'm glad when you have a spouse that you can talk about the Bible with. And we were talking about it, and she was bringing up this passage and sharing something that was on her heart about it. And I started looking at it in a little different take. Matter of fact, I never preached on the passage before, but knew in this series it would come right where it falls now. It's a difficult story, but not only difficult, because it's very difficult to our Western ears. Our Western ears, we hear the account, and we say, that's disturbing. And by the way, it is. But as you begin to look at it, you see some things that, God obviously puts in here for a reason. It seems like David was continually having to clean up Saul's mess. You just, you read through this story, you've seen it in the account. I mean, we're 35 messages into his life. You've seen it. How many times does Saul did something in the past? David's got to clean up the mess. Sometimes that happens. But there are two lesson, lessons that I learned when I was reading through it and studying it that much more. I'll give you these two lessons up front. Lesson number one is I learned very much the seriousness of sin. God takes sin very seriously. But there's a second thing I learned about, and I think this is one that we miss out many times. And I learned a lesson in this passage about the grimness of atonement. You say, oh, wait a minute, Pastor, what do you mean grimness? Well, you'll see that in just a little bit. You'll see it in the Old Testament, and you'll see it in the New Testament. The lessons in this passage teach us what God is concerned about. God is concerned about justice. God is concerned about honesty. And by the way, He still is. <laughs> God is concerned about morality, and He still is. God is still concerned about order as he still is here. So what does the passage teach us? Let me break it down for you very quickly this morning. I'll show you just three things in it, but they're very eye-opening. First one is the sin of Saul. You find that in the first two verses that we just read, the sin of Saul. The story here is given of a people called the Gibeonites. The Gibeonites can be traced all the way back to Joshua chapter number 9. 
as Joshua and the people had won the battle that they did over Jericho and then over Ai, going into the promised land, there was a group of people that acted like they had come from afar, but they had not. Their names were the Gibeonites. They acted like they were from a long ways away, and they had heard of Israel coming in the land, and so they basically wanted to make sure that Israel wasn't going to destroy them. So they told uh, Joshua and the leaders, we're from a faraway land, and, and uh, we just want to have a treaty with you. And so Joshua makes the mistake of making a, tre a treaty with them, that we will not destroy you. Then he finds out they're really just from around the corner. And they had deceived him, but they just figured this way. We'd rather be enslaved to you than die. And for the rest of the time, the Gibeonites would work for the nation of Israel. And Israel protected them. Matter of fact, there was a time, you remember the story where the sun stood still? That was all in protection of the Gibeonites. Because God knew they had made an oath. And so they rescued them. It's been 400 years since that covenant was made. And now something has happened to the Gibeonites. And the account is given to us here. Now, they should not have made the covenant. Israel should not have. Joshua should not have done that. But he did. God said, you made the covenant, you keep the covenant. God still is a, just like God is, God's a man of his word, is he not? God expects us to be also. So here he says, look, you made the covenant, you keep the covenant. In verse number one that we just read, there's a famine in Israel. The famine lasted three years. There's something I want to say just about this very quickly. This passage in verse number one does show us that there is a connection between the morality of a country and weather. It's clear as can be. All right? Now, I'm not saying that every time there is something weather-related, that is punishment for God. I did not say that. But it is clear that God can punish a nation with bad weather and inclement weather in order to get their attention. He does here. You, you can't miss it. All right? Three years, no rain. Famine in the land. And so, the account goes that David wants to get to the bottom of it. I like what David does. He does what was his custom. Look at verse number one. He inquired of the Lord. I want to point out something very interesting here because there's so much I could teach you out of this passage. But I find it very interesting to know this. Isn't it something how David knew this is not natural? This famine, David knew, was supernatural. It's as if God himself put his hand over the land and said, I'll allow no rain while this is going to be dealt with. You say, well, how did David know that? He was a man after God's own heart. A man after God's own heart understands how God operates. A man after God's own heart always wants God's input. And so David sees this famine for three years, no rain, and he right away says, Lord, what is the problem? This is not natural. This is supernatural. You have done this. And God gives him an answer. The Lord said, it's for Saul and for his bloody house. He slew the Gibeonites. David, you asked, I'll tell you. I'm not going to bless Israel until this is dealt with. Saul was wrong to the Gibeonites. He killed many of the Gibeonites. And as a result of it, it must be dealt with. Matter of fact, verse number two, he calls them together and brings about to figure out what is going on. Now, you may say, why does Saul do this? We don't get all the details. I can tell you this, just from my personal study of this passage and some other ones back in 1 Samuel, uh, specifically around chapter number 22, I think what he was doing, what Saul did, is he was killing Gibeonites and taking their land, and he was giving that land to those who supported him. Matter of fact, he basically says that in chapter 22 of 1 Samuel. So he is going to the Gibeonites, and he is killing them and taking their land and taking their homes and taking their vineyards and taking everything they had and giving them to them that followed him. That's what he was doing. So he is a sinner as a result of it. Matter of fact, 
Apparently, his whole family was involved. Notice that it says it is for Saul and for his bloody house. Apparently, his whole family was involved in that. Now, you may look at that and say, oh, well, pastor, what's the big deal? Well, in Deuteronomy chapter number 5, verse number 11, God says this is a big deal because when you do something in my name, you keep it. When you do something and you tie my name to it, you don't blaspheme my name. You keep the covenant. And he looks at Israel and he says, you made a covenant with them. You did it in my name. You will honor it because it's done in my name. Listen, I want to say this. Please listen. God takes his name very seriously. God doesn't want his name flippantly used. God does want somebody doing something in his name that does not bring honor and glory and is not holy unto him. All right, little lesson here. Guard your mouth. Do not, do not take the Lord's name in vain. It is a blessed name. It is a holy name. It is a reverent name, and it ought to be treated as such. I used to tell you this story about my mother. My mother, if there's one thing she could not stand, but there were a lot of things she could not stand, but there was one thing she could not stand was anybody taking the Lord's name in vain. How many times when something would be in a store somewhere, going down through a grocery store just as a little boy, and, and someone would take the Lord's name in vain, and my mother would look at her two sons and say, listen, don't, your ears better burn all the time, boys. When you hear someone take the Lord's name in vain, she'd stop right in the store and do that. He said, what if someone heard? She wanted them to hear. And may she always use those words, may your ears always burn when someone takes the Lord's name in vain. Oh, by the way, mine are still burning. God takes his name very seriously. It is a big deal. When, you, when God's name is, is the legal power that you have bound yourself by when you make a formal agreement, you take it and you don't break it and you don't blaspheme God. So here's the sin of Saul. Second thing I need you to see very quickly is the settlement of David. The settlement. David says, all right, we're going to deal with this. Verse number three, he asks them, uh, he wants to know what can we do to deal with this? Interesting what he says, what shall I do for you and wherewith shall I make the atonement that ye may bless the inheritance of the Lord? Now it's interesting when he says I can bless the inheritance of the Lord. Just put a little note beside that and just write down Genesis chapter number 12, verse number three. Just make that note, all right, just put it in there. Why is that? Because God told Abraham in Genesis chapter number 12, I will bless him that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. So what he understands is this. David's looking all the way back to the time of Abraham and it was so important that the nations of the world were in line with Israel. And so he's saying, I need you to do this. We need to get this right so we can keep the blessing blessing of the inheritance of the Lord. He's going all the way back to the Abrahamic covenant. And so the answer, they say, verse number four, we can't do anything about it. Matter of fact, they say, we will have no silver nor gold of Saul nor his house. He's saying this to them. We, we can't do anything about it. It's not in our power to do it. And look, I like this too. We're not looking for money. Boy, that slaps us in the day's world we live in. It's not a money thing. You can't buy your way out of it. Hold on to that. I'll bring that up a little bit later. Verse number five, they said, the man that consumed us and devised against us that we should be destroyed from remaining in any of the coast of Israel. They come back and they say, Saul and his family have been guilty of this. What's interesting, this sin was committed 30 years before this passage. 30 years not dealt with. David, remember, he's been on the throne for years, already had the thing with Absalom. I mean, it's been 30 years David's been on the throne at least. They said this has taken place, and the only way it can be dealt with is for it to be dealt with for them to be put to death. Wow. Look at verse 6. Let seven men of his sons be delivered unto us, and we will hang them. Seven of these sons of Saul to be delivered to the Gibeonites to be hung. An interesting passage of what they say in verse 7. Notice they say, because of the Lord's oath that was between them, between David and Jonathan, the son of Saul. 
it's interesting when they say that because in verse 6, they say, this is the Saul whom the Lord did choose. Now watch this. Here's what they're saying. Just because God puts you in that place, you don't have the right to do whatever you want. You obey the king. You see, they understood God put Saul on the throne, but because Saul was on the throne, that doesn't mean he could do whatever he wants to whoever he wants and do whatever he pleases. You see, listen, when you take something before God and he puts you in a place, you are his servant and you operate everything you do within the accordance of this book. Whether it's your home, whether it's your office, wherever it is. All right, we know the Lord chose him, but he wasn't listening to the Lord, and we know that's a fact. Notice, if you would, then in verse number 7, Mephibosheth is spared, and David keeps his covenant with Jonathan. You see, God's judgment may not come immediately, but watch this, it will come. Thirty years. So, verse number 7, the king spared Mephibosheth, and the others were delivered unto them. Notice, if you would, in verse number 8. But the king took the two sons of Rizpah, the daughter of Aya, whom she bare unto Saul, Armoni and Mephibosheth, and the five sons of Michael, the daughter of Saul. Actually, these were sons of Merib, but it would have fallen under Michael. Michael never had any children, but it was under Merib, her sister, whom she brought up for Adriel, the son of Barzillai, the Meholathite. Notice verse 9. And he delivered them to the hands of the Gibeonites, and they hanged them in the hill before the Lord, and they fell all seven together and were put to death in the days of harvest, in the first days, in the beginning of barley harvest. So, recap real quick. The Gibeonites come in, they say there are seven that have violated us that way. They did not fulfill the oath of the covenant made before God. David says, you're right, and he delivers them over. Five are the sons of Merib, two are the sons of a lady by the name of Rizpah. And they are delivered over to the Gibeonites, and the Gibeonites do exactly what they said they were going to do. All right? Carried it out. Notice it was carried out at the beginning of barley harvest. All right? Now stop right there at the end of verse number 9. Watch. Everybody look up here. Watch up here. Watch, watch. Are you with me? Look at verse number 10. And Rizpah, the daughter of Aya, took sackcloth and spread it for her upon the rock. From the beginning of harvest until water dropped upon them out of heaven. And suffer neither the birds of the air to rest on them by day, nor the beasts of the field by night. The third thing I want you to see, the final point, is the sorrow of Rizpah. Here's what's strange. We already have a strange story. But now it's just like it gets stranger. You ever seen that happen before? You see something happen, and then you, then you look at it and say, wow, it just took another turn. Rizpah, her name means hot coal. She is mentioned in 2 Samuel chapter number 3 and verse number 7. It's very interesting why this is given, and I'll tell you why. Let me just read a verse to you. Listen to what the Bible says in Deuteronomy 28 and why this is interesting. You, you've got to stay with me on this. I'm going to teach you a little something, then I may finish out by preaching. Deuteronomy chapter number 28. Now listen to one verse. Listen to verse number 26. And thy carcass shall be meat unto all fowls of the air and unto the beasts of the earth, and no man shall fray them away. Now, stay with me. That is talking about when those are punished that way and put to death. Now, why does Deuteronomy say this? And now we come to this passage and we want to say, what is going on here? Notice the picture we have. Here's what happens. Rizpah has just seen two of her sons put to death. And here's what's interesting. Their bodies are laid out. I know it's a disturbing scene, but it's, it's a picture God gave it to us. There's a reason for it. And their bodies are laid out. 
And she guards those bodies so the animals don't get them and the birds don't eat them. Now, let me give you a picture. Let's go further. Watch this. From the beginning of barley harvest to the first rains, watch, listen, is for six months. She guarded those bodies for six months. Now you may say, well, why weren't they buried? I'll tell you why I think they weren't buried. David wanted to make sure the rain started up again, that God was pleased before he was going to go a step further. That's the way David operated. He dealt with something, and he wanted to know that God was going to deal with it, and God was going to do whatever God wanted to do before he was ever going to go a step further. But can you imagine what Rizpah does for six months? Verse 11. And it was told David what Rizpah, the daughter of Ea, the concubine of Saul, had done. This is where the title of the message comes. She got the attention of the king. For six months, day in and day out, she chased those animals away and those birds away from the bodies of her sons. And finally, the attention comes to David. Isn't it interesting to note the rain had started again? So what does David do? Look at verse number 12. We're almost finished. And David went and took the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan, his son, from the men of Jabesh Gilead that had stolen them from the street of Bethshan, where the Philistines had hanged them, when the Philistines had slain Saul and Gilboa. And he brought them up from thence, the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan, his son. And they gathered the bones of them that were hanged. And the bones of Saul and Jonathan, his son, buried they in the country of Benjamin in Zelah, in the sepulcher of Kish, his father, and they performed all that the king commanded. Watch this. And after that, God was entreated for the land. One thing I've learned about David in this message is David was a passionate man, passionate heart. That's why he had a heart for God, passionate. David gives everyone then a proper burial. Rizpah got his attention. I think David wants this matter now finally put to rest. Notice he takes all of them. He gets the body of Saul. He gets the body of Jonathan. And you'll remember back to when they died. I'm not going to go through that again. But it's interesting. He links them all, if you would, to the same sin. He links them all to the same judgment, but he wants it dealt with. Finally put away, finally dealt with, finally handled in a right way. If I had time, I would show you this also. In, when Solomon comes to the throne and builds the temple, in 2 Chronicles chapter number 6, as he lifts up that prayer of consecration up before God when the temple is laid out, do you know what he says? Oh, Lord, he says, when you stop the rain, may we confess our sins and get that forgiveness that we need. I'm just telling you this, Solomon learned something from his daddy, how God works. All right, what a story, huh? I may be honest today and say, look, pastor, never even knew that story. Raise your hand. Anybody in here? Yeah, a lot of people. May not know it was in there. There it is. You've seen it. So now you say, so what? What are the lessons? There are three points to the message. There are three lessons and we're finished. Number one, there's a lesson from Rizpah. Get the attention of the king. I want to make sure in my life I do everything that I need to do in order to do in order to make sure I always have the attention of the king. I want the king to know everything about me. He already does. But Rizpah did whatever was needed to. I mean, what a mother's heart. Get the attention of the king. I learned that from Rizpah. 
But I also learned a lesson from Saul. You say, wait a minute, how'd you learn something from Saul? He's dead. No, I learned something. And I started the message with this. I learned from Saul in this passage the awfulness of sin. Sin grieves God. Sin is horrible in the sight of God. We have so in our day and age limited it down and watered it down and really thought when we see sin today, well, I'm really not that bad. I mean, someone else, they're, they're a lot worse than I am. I mean, that guy at work, he's worse than me. And my neighbor, you wouldn't believe what he does. All sin is an affront to God. The awfulness of sin. And I learned that from this passage. And God doesn't forget it. He knows sin separates us from Him. He knows He's a holy God, and that's why He says, Be ye holy, for I am holy. I learned that. I want to say this. I never want to forget how ugly sin is. The awfulness of sin. I learned that from Saul. I learned the attention of the king from Rizpah. But the last lesson that I learn in here is from David. And the last lesson I learn, I share this with you, is the atonement for sin. David says something very interesting. I told you to mark it down in verse number three. What shall I do for you? Wherewith shall I make, watch this, the atonement? Kafar, the substitute, something for that sin. What can I do, what can I possibly do to atone for this sin? And do you remember what they came back and they said, look, it's not going to take silver, and it's not going to take gold. Matter of fact, there's nothing we can do. Watch this. There is a, they come to David, Gibeonites do, and said, listen, there can be no atonement unless there is the shedding of of blood. Now you picture that in the Old Testament. And your mind ought to run to Hebrews chapter number 9 where he says, without the shedding of blood, there could be no remission of sin. You see, what I have learned in this passage so much is the grimness of of atonement a mighty holy God saw a sinful people and listen as much as that cross that we see is a beautiful symbol to us and we look at it and we're reminded once again my that Christ died for me but oh my friend may we never ever forget the shedding of his blood and the grimness of that atonement as he was beaten, and as he was nailed to that cross, and he did it for you, and he did it for me. Oh, we never forget, it cost him his life. But you know what we want to do? I'll buy it. And now what the world says? You ought to see me, I'm a good person. I could do it myself. The Gibeonites were smart. They said, there's no amount of silver you have. There's no amount of gold you have. There must be the shedding of blood. And God says, there's a picture of what I'm going to do in the New Testament. Atonement, I'm going to use this word because it's so true, was bloody. There is nothing pretty about the cross. You can gold plate it. I'm not against that. You can do all those things. I'm for that. I understand that. But it was an offense. Cursed is the one who hangs on a tree. But God said, if we don't do that, there could be no forgiveness of sins. There can be no remission. So when David used the word there, he knew what he was doing. What can we do for atonement? I come to you today and I tell you, what can we do for atonement? There's no amount of gold. There's no amount of silver. There's no amount of good works. There must be the shedding of blood.
And he died for you, and he died for me, so that we might have forgiveness of sins, eternal life, atonement. Wow. Father, I thank you for this passage. It is so picturesque, if you would, of what happens with the death of your son.